Sure, I'm glad to see you this morning. You doing well? Yeah. All right, good. I'm glad you're here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Going to talk about what is faith this morning. What is faith? Galatians, chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 15, while you're finding your way there, real quick. A uh, couple of things. And beginning in verse 15, let's talk this morning about what is faith. Galatians 2, and starting in verse 15, Paul says, even we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by doing the works of law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing works of the law, because by doing the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Look at verse 20 of Galatians 2, some of the most famous words of Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the people that you love so much. I pray that you'd come and that we would encounter you in the ministry of your word and that you would impart faith to us in Jesus' name. If your heart agrees, just say amen. amen. I wonder if there's anyone else here this morning that could use a little bit more faith. Maybe you have a situation confronting you in your life right now, and you could just use some more faith to help meet uh, that situation. As we've been working hard on phase two, uh, there's an old song that's been playing in my head. You know, I grew up in the church, and so I only remember scripture in King James, and uh, I only remember the old songs. So um, they were better. You know, we sang a lot of beautiful new songs this morning, but this song, I'm going to teach you a new song, or I'm going to help you relearn an old song, and uh, this is going to be the song you're going to sing all week. Now, Pastor Nick's going to come help us teach it. It says, Faith in God can move the mighty mountains. Faith can calm the troubled sea. Faith can make a fountain in the desert. Faith can bring the victory. Is there anybody who goes far enough back that you remember that song? Joanne, I knew you'd know that song. Uh, come on, there's a few There's a few of us. Now, listen, 5.30 service last night was so miserable singing this song that you have to stand, all right? Because it just goes better if you stand. So stand up on your feet, and Pastor Nick's going to help us. Come on, let's learn a, a new song or relearn an old song. Help us, Pastor Nick. Come on, sing it. Try this. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Oh, have faith in God. Oh, have faith in God for the answer. Have faith. 
you. Don't you feel like you have more faith already? God bless you. You may be seated. Let's talk about what is faith. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Oh, you did so much better than the 530 service. It's my fault. I let them sit in their seats, so I'll fix that next week. Every book in the Bible contains a verse or two that is the key to interpreting that particular book. It gives the thesis statement, if you will, the main point. In the Gospel of John, it's chapter 20, verse 31. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in His name. In the book of Romans, it's chapter 1, verse 17. In the Gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that comes by faith from the first to the last, for the just shall live by faith. Right now we're studying Paul's letter to the new believers in the region of Galatia. That's modern day Turkey. This is no ordinary letter. It's a letter from heaven. It's a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. And Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 is the interpretive key for understanding the whole book. We know that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by works of the law, no flesh shall ever be justified. Paul talks about living by faith, and the rest of the book of Galatians explains what that means and what that looks like. But I want to take a moment this morning, and I want to talk to you about what is faith. Now, don't confuse that with where is faith, which is what I say a hundred times a day. I open my office door, where's faith? No, we're going to talk about what is faith. As Christians, we're saved by faith. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We're strong in faith. We rejoice in faith. We defend ourselves with the shield of faith. We overcome by faith. We are called the household of faith. Faith is absolutely essential to being a Christ follower. So what is faith exactly? As I look at Paul's words, I find seven things that I want to share with you. Now, don't panic. We'll get you out of here sort of on time, all right? So seven things that I want to share with you quickly about what is faith. First of all, faith is a gift from God. Beloved, look at me. Not everyone has faith. Paul said so. He wrote to the Thessalonians, Pray for us that we might be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. Not everyone believes in God. Not everyone believes that Jesus is Lord. Not everyone believes in the coming judgment and in heaven and in hell. Actually, those who don't believe can't believe. Paul said that the God of this age, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they're unable to see the truth about Jesus. You know, that describes the spiritual state of every one of us unless and until God comes and makes his light of revelation shine in our hearts and enables us to understand the truth about Jesus. Faith has a beginning in your heart. Paul says, faith comes to you. You see, faith is not an exercise of human righteousness that you have somehow managed to produce. It's not a human virtue that you possess while others don't. Faith is a divine gift given from God above. If you have faith, you don't have it because you had it already. You don't have it because you chose to have it. You don't have it because you work to achieve it. If you have faith, it is only because God has given it to you. Paul wrote this to the Ephesians, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is the gift? The saving grace and the faith that released it to you. Paul wrote to the Philippians, it has been granted unto you to believe on Christ. On the second missionary journey, God spoke to Paul in a dream and directed him to the Greek city of Philippi. 
When Paul arrived, he went searching on the riverbank for a prayer group of Gentile people who were sympathetic to the Jewish faith. He found them and he began sharing the good news about Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. One of the women in the group was a businesswoman named Lydia. And even though she wasn't Jewish, the Bible said she was a worshiper of God. But Acts 16, 14 says that as Paul shared about Jesus, the Lord opened her heart and enabled her to respond to Paul's message. In verse 15, that response is called believing. Actually, there's an important message for all of us in Lydia's conversion. No matter how much effort we might put into seeking God, we could never ever find God unless He takes the initiative to reveal Himself to us and gives us the faith to believe. Lydia is what we call today a seeker. She sincerely wanted to know the true God. She sincerely wanted to worship the true God. But Lydia would have never found God if God hadn't taken the initiative 15 years earlier to knock Paul off of his high horse and call him into the ministry. Lydia would have never found God if God hadn't taken the initiative to speak to Paul through a vision and call him to Philippi. Actually, the Macedonian man he saw in his dream turned out to be a woman. You know, some of the best men of God I've ever known have been women. <laughs> Lydia would have never found God if God hadn't sent Paul out on the riverbank searching for her. Lydia would have never found God if God hadn't given Paul a message to preach and an anointing to preach it. Lydia would have never found God if God hadn't opened her heart in that moment and enabled her to believe on Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Realizing that faith is God's divine gift, two attitudes occur to me immediately. The first is humility. Among those of us who have faith, I think there's a constant battle to resist spiritual pride. There's this continual nagging temptation to believe that somehow, in some little itty bitty way, we must have deserved Christ. There must have been some quality of heart. There must have been some inner virtue, some spiritual desire that explains why we have come to faith while others have not. But the scriptures don't let us get away with that. The story of Lydia, for one, shows us that when it comes to faith, we bring absolutely nothing to the bargaining table of salvation. God says to Isaiah, all right, fine, you want to negotiate? Let's sit down. Let's reason together. Let's bargain. Here's my offer. Though your sins are as scarlet, I will wash them as white as snow. The best of our efforts aren't enough to find God. Unless God reveals himself and enables us to respond, there would be no faith. That's why Paul wrote to the Romans, Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. It is God who has distributed faith to you. Romans 12 verse 3. Realizing that faith is God's divine gift, the second attitude that immediately occurs to me is gratitude. Think about it. What has God done in your life that you should be sitting here today? Everyone else is out there partying it up for Memorial Day weekend. I know you're going to go barbecue too just as soon as you get out of here. <laughs> but you're here. Here you are sitting there all justified. Here you are, sitting there all sanctified. Here you are, sitting there all blood-bought and Holy Ghost-filled. Here you are, heirs of eternal life. Here you are, members of the family of God, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. What has God done for you that you're here? Even as an old man, John still couldn't get over the awe and the wonder and the beauty of it all. Look at this. What kind of love is this that we should be called the sons and daughters of God? 
And I tell you, even on your darkest, even on your most difficult day on earth, you have something to be undyingly grateful for to God, and that is that He has given you the gift of faith. Thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift. What is faith? Gotta hurry. Faith is God's gift to us. Second, that means that faith is the opposite of self-reliance. This truth is at the very heart of the letter of Galatians, and it's at the very heart of the gospel. We know that a person is not justified by his own efforts, but only by faith in Jesus. Can I tell you that even though the particulars are different from Paul's day to our day, we actually wrestle with precisely the same issues. One of them is the tendency to believe that uh, we can do it ourselves. The tendency towards self-reliance, self-righteousness. You see, inherent in our fallen sinful nature is the incorrect belief that when it comes to salvation, I got this. I can do this. Maybe it relates back to the original temptation and sin in the garden Adam and Eve bought the lie that they could survive, even thrive, independently of God, and men have believed it ever since. Whatever the case, the human heart is incorrigibly proud by nature. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is destruction. Quite frankly, we are all just a little bit smug. When it comes to religion, human pride manifests itself in acts of piety, acts that appear to be humble, acts that appear to be self-deprecating, but behind it is the mask of pride because we're trying to earn our way to heaven. There was once a very bright young Christian man. He was an aspiring law student. And he was on summer break and walking through a field one day when a violent summer storm came along and a bolt of lightning struck on the ground right next to him, knocked him right off of his feet. He was so terrified and freaked out by the lightning bolt almost hitting him that to his father's dismay, he dropped out of law school and became a Catholic monk. And not just any monk. He joined an extremely ascetic sect He became the most ascetic of them all. He awoke at 3 o'clock every morning to pray, to repent for his sins. Whipped himself bloody, starved himself half to death, deprived himself of light and of heat, slept in the winter cold with no blankets on his bed, all trying to atone for his sins, make up for his sins. But all of his penance, all of his efforts at self-vindication brought him absolutely no peace. In fact, he began to hate God. He said almost to the point of complete blasphemy. He visited Rome, and as an act of devotion, he decided to climb the Scala Sancta on his knees, white marble steps that lead to the private chapel of the early popes. According to church tradition, Jesus walked on these steps on his way into Pilate's palace, on his way into trial. The steps were moved from Jerusalem to Rome in the 4th century by Constantine's mother. And this young monk spent hours climbing up those white marble steps on his knees, reciting prayers all the way. When he finally reached the top step, a thought floated through his mind. A verse of scripture, in fact. The just shall live by faith. The young monk was Martin Luther. And the the revelation that he had on the Scala Sancta began the greatest revolution in human history since the day of Pentecost. The just shall live by faith because no one can be justified by his own merits. You know, it's highly unlikely that any of us would ever resort to the extremes of Martin Luther. I know I wouldn't. And yet none of us is immune to the religious pride that drove him. None of us is immune from the temptation to believe that in some little itty bitty way we deserve our salvation. Because of our deep devotion to Christ and his church. 
because of our superior moral standards, because of our undying service to others, because of our benevolent giving. Do you know what you did last week? Do you know what you gave to our friends Kevin and Lucy Donaldson and Project Rescue? You gave so much money that we put 11 girls through an entire year of housing and school and clothing. 11 little girls because of your generosity. But we can be tempted to believe because of everything we've done for missions that, that maybe in some small way we deserve Christ. The great New Testament scholar and Pentecostal Gordon Fee asked this question, do I secretly hold on to the notion that God is just a little bit fortunate to have me on his side? Faith and self-reliance are mutually exclusive. Faith and self-righteousness are polar opposites. Faith and self-vindication are diametrically opposed. Instead of saying, I'll do it myself, faith admits, no, I can't do it myself. Faith admits neediness. It acknowledges helplessness. Jesus called it poverty of spirit, the inner realization that I bring absolutely nothing to the table. Jesus listed that as the first necessary beautiful attitude of the heart by which we gain access to the kingdom of heaven. Faith is the recognition that I am sinful and that God has provided for my forgiveness through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Faith is trust in Jesus alone. What is faith? It's the opposite of self-reliance, and that brings us to the next truth. Number three, faith is being convinced somewhere deep inside that God is righteous. Biblical faith, Christian faith, faith that saves us, faith that justifies us, has a proper and an exclusive content. Beloved, listen, this is so important. Faith is not just believing any old thing. We're not talking about faith in the power of faith. We're not just talking about thinking positive thoughts and hoping for the best. Faith is believing the right things about God and his son, Jesus. Faith has a beginning. It comes through the revelation of the word. Paul said, now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Many people receive God's revelation while the Bible is being taught, while it's being preached. Sometimes when a Christian one-on-one -on -one is sharing the truth about Jesus, others receive it while reading the Bible. Sometimes even they receive a revelation from just a single line of scripture. But there is a content to faith. Faith is faith in Christ. He is the object of our faith. He is the substance of our faith. Faith is having confidence in him. It's trusting his goodness. You know, in order to trust in Christ, I have to know something good about him. Even if it's just the littlest bit, I have to have some source of positive expectation that he means to do me good. Satan convinced Adam and Eve God is unfair, God is unjust, God is unloving, God is arbitrary, he's a control freak, his rules are petty. They believed him and men have believed him ever since, but faith is trust that God is good. In Romans 10, Paul says, faith is in your head and it's in your heart. It enters through your ears and your mind receives it. And your spirit conceives and your heart believes. Faith engages your whole person, catches your attention, floods your thoughts. It apprehends your imagination. It captures your heart. It captivates your emotions. Faith is movement toward God, specifically movement towards Jesus. It's pursuing God. It's becoming a God chaser. A few years ago, we met our friend Pastor Paneer from India. And he shared the story of how he came to faith. He grew up as an orphan out on the streets of India. He was the lowest of the low. In fact, his situation was so bad that even the other orphans on the street made fun of him. As a young teenager, he had only one pair of pants, and it was split right across the backside. 
And the other kids on the street called him mailbox because the flap in his pants reminded them of a mail slot and they would come up behind him and pour garbage and rocks down the back of his pants. Two times he tried to kill himself by taking poison and it failed twice. He became even more depressed. He said, nobody wants me, not even death wants me. Finally, he decided to commit suicide by lying across the train tracks. And while he was lying there waiting for a train to come, he noticed a little white piece of paper blowing down the tracks toward him. It flittered and fluttered and landed right next to his head and he picked up the piece of paper and he read the words. It was a Christian missionary tract. And printed on the back were the words of John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will obey my commands. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. How amazing. Have you ever seen a scripture like that on a tract? I think God printed that one just for him. I think it was a one of the kind. He said when he read those words, before he read them, he, he wasn't afraid to die. He wanted to die, but when he read those words, he was afraid to die. He got up off the tracks, and he decided he had to find out who said those words, what they meant. He, he didn't know where they came from. He didn't know they were the words of Jesus. He didn't know they were from the Christian Bible. All he knew is he had to find out. He said like a deranged person. He walked through town showing the paper to everyone that would give him a moment of their time. No one could tell him. Finally, he found someone who had been raised in a Catholic school or, or taught in a Catholic school. And they recognized that the words were from the Christian Bible. He said, go ask the Christian missionary. He'll tell you. And on his way to find the missionary, he prayed, Christian God, I don't know who you are. But I will love you if you will love me and make me a family. The missionary told him about Jesus. That day he became part of the family of God. He became part of a church family. He became part of the missionary's family. The missionary took him in. Don't have time to tell you the whole story, but miraculously the Lord opened the way for him to go to university. He earned a bachelor's degree. And then three master's degrees. And then a PhD. God gave him a wife and two children. One's now a doctor, the other's a lawyer. And in addition to being a pastor, he's a university professor and he's a minister, high ranking in the Indian government. <laughs> what happened to him? Through the word of God, he received just the tiniest shred of revelation about God. It was God who sent that paper whistling down those train tracks. And when he read just one line of revelation, God opened his heart and enabled him to believe. And his whole person became engaged. His thoughts, his imaginations, his emotions, and his will. And that brings us to the next truth. What is faith? Number four. Faith is surrendering your will in response to an encounter with God. After you're convinced, there comes a personal commitment. I have to admit that this is the aspect of faith that intrigues me the most. If any element of saving faith may be said to be contingent on us, this would be it. Faith is not necessarily my ability to believe, but it is my willingness to concede, God, you're right. Faith is saying uncle to God. John says believing is receiving Jesus. Receiving his words about himself. Receiving his words about myself. Receiving his words about the coming judgment, about heaven and about hell. Faith is saying yes to Jesus. It's relinquishing independence, surrendering autonomy. It's submitting to his leadership. Faith is Peter and Andrew and James and John leaving their nets and following Jesus. I always felt sorry for poor Zebedee, their father. They left him all scumbadi sitting there all alone in the boat. <laughs> Faith is Matthew leaving his tax booth. 
Faith is Zacchaeus joyfully forfeiting his entire fortune, something the self-righteous young synagogue elder couldn't bring himself to do. Faith is the blind man leaving behind his begging cloak on the road and following Jesus. Listen, that's not to say quit your day job. It means leave behind your old way of life and follow Jesus. And faith remains constant in our life on earth as Christians. Paul said, now abides faith. The same way that we start out in Christ, we carry on in Christ, living a surrendered life. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. To live by faith means to live in a continual state of surrender to Jesus. What is faith? Seven truths. We're on number five. Now see, you were panicking, weren't you, when I told you seven things. Here we are at five already, and they're getting shorter and shorter. What is faith? Number five, I like this one. Faith comes in measures. This is an interesting truth. Do you like my little picture there? <laughs> Even though we all receive faith from the same source, we don't all receive from God the same portion of faith. We don't all possess the same measure. Jesus commended a Gentile woman and a Roman officer for having greater faith than any Jew he found in Israel. Jesus chided his disciples for having too little faith based on all the revelation that they had received from him. You see, some people's faith suffers from arrested development. Based on all the opportunity they've had, it should be further along than it is. Some people's faith is growing. Some people's faith is weak and faltering. Paul said some have made a shipwreck of their faith. The Spirit clearly says in the last days, some will abandon the faith. And it's true, embracing knowledge so-called some have departed from the faith. Some have denied the faith. Some are rejected by God for faith. 2 Timothy 3, verse 8. Some destroy the faith of others. I'm absolutely persuaded that there is nothing that you or I could ever do to get faith starting out. But there is definitely a lot that we can do to add to our faith. Just like your life. You have absolutely nothing to do with your arrival here on earth. That was between your father and your mother and God. By the way, people make mistakes, but God never does. If you're here, it's because God planned for you to be here, whether anyone else planned it or not. God granted your life. His breath is in your lungs. You didn't have anything to do with the origin of your life, but you have everything to do with the outcomes of your life. And that's just like faith. You didn't do anything to get it, but it's up to you to keep it and to nurture it. Use it or lose it. Neglect it or build it. Build it through the Word of God. Build it through prayer. Ask Jesus. The disciples specifically asked Jesus, Lord, give us more faith. Build your faith by praying in the Spirit. That's praying in tongues, Jude says. Peter wrote, make every effort to add to your faith. Build yourselves up in faith. Hebrews says, hold firmly to your faith. James says, endure the testing of your faith. Paul said, continue in your faith. Guard your faith. Fight for your faith. Be sound in your faith. Strengthen your faith. Grow in your faith more and more. Be nourished in the deep truths of the faith. Supply what is lacking in faith. Pursue faith. Keep the faith. Spread the faith. Have faith in God. What is faith? Seven truths. Here we are already at number six, and I have two quick things to give you while the worship team comes. I like this one. What is faith? Number six, faith is messy. That's the reason why people prefer self-reliance. Faith is not neat and tidy. Faith is not well organized nor orderly. Faith is not logical, sequential. Faith is not self-sufficient. Faith is not, don't worry, I got this covered. Faith is not, listen, this is the best tweetable line of the morning. Faith is not human ability showcased. Faith is human weakness exposed. 
Faith is vulnerable. Faith is needy. Faith is helpless. Faith is childlike. It's dependent. It's desperate. It's dire straits. Faith is impossible situations. Faith is a father pleading on his knees in the sand. Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Would you come lay your hand on her? I know if you do, she'll be well. Faith is a bleeding woman having spent all that she had on doctors and having suffered much and having gotten no better but having gotten worse and having heard about Jesus. Made her way through a crowd and snuck up behind him and touched the corner of his prayer saw because she heard there is healing in his wings. Listen to me, faith is creatively determined. Faith is four men carrying their friends on a stretcher to Jesus. And when they saw that they couldn't get near the door, they spied an outdoor staircase to the roof and they carried him up and they tore a hole on the roof to get to Jesus. Faith is the mother of a demonized girl refusing to take no for an answer from Jesus and thinking fast on her feet. Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Faith is a Roman officer thinking twice about his decision to send influential people to talk him up in front of Jesus and sending a second messenger instead to simply say, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. Faith is a forgiven woman crashing a private dinner party because she heard Jesus was there and she just had to bring him a gift to say thank you. Faith is a blind man on the side of the road shouting at the top of his lungs, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And when they tell faith to be quiet, faith shouts all the louder. Faith is a life-threatening storm at sea. Faith is 5,000 hungry men and no food to eat. Faith is an overdue tax bill and a coin in a fish's mouth. Faith is a borrowed crib, a borrowed boat, a borrowed coin, a borrowed donkey, a borrowed upper room, and a borrowed tomb. Faith is a congregation of over a 1,000 people. Worshiping in a building that holds 300. Faith is $1 million in the building fund, $3 million in pledges, and a $14 million building to erect. Faith is grandfathered zoning approvals that expire next spring, eight months from now, unless the foundation of phase two is in the ground. Yes, I would say that faith is very messy. But that's okay. Because there's one final thing that I've learned about faith that I want to leave you with. What is faith's seven truths? You ready for the last one? Faith is powerful. Even just a little bit. And that brings us to the mustard seeds. You have your mustard seeds? You put them away, didn't you? You put them in your purse, you put them in your pocket. You got your mustard seeds. There's two things that Jesus said about mustard seeds. First, he said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, even just a little bit, you can say to the mountain, be thou removed and it will move. Second, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man planted in his field and though it's such a tiny seed it grows into a large herb even a shrub so that birds come and perch in its branches oh yes I have learned I've learned over the last 15 years leading this church that faith is messy it operates in the realm of circumstances that are beyond our control but I've also learned that faith is powerful even just a little bit 
I remember when Pastor Tate told me that God was calling him on from Harvest Time Church. He was the senior pastor. I was the associate. We had just secured this piece of property under a contract. We were working with the architects and engineers to design the whole campus, this building, and to show it to the town to get zoning approval. And Pastor Tate comes to me and tells me that God has called him to leave. I have to tell you the truth, I was angry at first. But he said this to me. He said, Glenn, I don't have the fire in the belly to build this building, and I see that you do. What he was saying to me is, I see God has given you faith for it. Please, please, please don't misunderstand me. It's not that his faith was lacking in any regard. In fact, it took much more faith for him to listen and obey God and go than to stay right here. The church that he led for the next 10 years is bigger than harvest time now. The church he's pastored for the last two years started with 17 people, and it's half the size of harvest time now in two years. It's not that my faith was stronger than his, but he could see that God had given me a special deposit of faith to see this through, not just phase one, but phase one and phase two have to tell you the truth. Phase one, it was an uphill climb the entire way. I think we did pretty good. I think it came out okay. Don't you think so? It was an uphill climb the whole way. And yet inside of me, I want to tell you, there was a mustard seed of faith. There was a knowing somewhere in the deepest place inside of me that God was going to see us through. In fact, God made me a promise. Be strong and very courageous. You will lead these people into their inheritance. Little did I ever dream how big the shrub would grow in phase one, nor how many beautiful birds that God would send to rest in our branches. I think about all the ministries born here, Alpha Course, Cleansing Stream, Equip Classes, Pathways Ministry. We're gonna have our first graduation from Pathways Ministry next week. What a day it's gonna be children's ministries, student ministries, college ministry, young adult ministry, seniors ministry, couples ministry, prayer ministry, missions that we've done, Stanford Harvest. Think about Pastor Melanie and Iglesia Tiempo de Cosecha. Think about their daughter, Church, that was born in Norwalk. I think about three Harvest Time churches that have been born in South America. Pastor Helio and our beautiful Brazilian fellowship, our beautiful Filipino fellowship, our friends from Messiah's House, the homeschool co-op that meets here during the daytimes. God has put a school of worship in my heart for our kids and our teenagers. I haven't even told the staff about it. I kind of break news to them a little bit at a time so I don't overwhelm them. It's going to be good. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Watch what grows. Plant it and watch what grows. Faith is like a mustard seed. Just a little bit is very powerful. So here we are again in another messy faith situation. This is another fine mess you've gotten us into. Ready to break ground on a building that in the natural we can't really afford. But I want to tell you, in the deepest place inside of me, there's a mustard seed of faith that knows the same God who brought us through 11 years ago is ready to bring us through again. If you want to know the truth, I don't find myself wondering about the money, how we're going to get it, where it's going to come from. What I find myself wondering about is how big the shrub is going to grow and how many more birds God is going to send to our branches. So I've given you a little bottle of mustard seeds. They're not magic. I didn't pray over them. I didn't wave my hand. If you, if you put them in the garden, they will not magically grow a ladder to heaven for you. But I gave them to you just in case there's someone else here who has a messy faith situation of your own. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your kids. Maybe it's in your health. Can I tell you, Jesus is greater than cancer. 
Jesus can defeat cancer. There's nothing too hard for him. Maybe you have a messy faith situation in your finances. Maybe it's in your career. I don't know where it is. But maybe these mustard seeds will remind you that faith really is messy. But it's also very powerful, even just a little bit. Let your faith be built. Be encouraged. Be strengthened in your innermost being with the strength that comes from the Holy Spirit. Have faith in God. Would you stand and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place.